Moving on then to the pore pressure response in our illustrative example. Recall that in the equivalent linear scheme, the generation of excess pore pressures is related to the cyclic stress ratio. In this illustrative example, we note that our CSR is very high. We have values of 0 0.3, 0 0.35, and higher. Again, so that we are somewhere in this region here. And so it only takes less than 10 cycles to produce liquefaction. So we can tell already from the cyclic stress ratio that our R sub U values are likely 1, which means that our excess pore pressure or the change in the pore pressure will be set equal to the minor effective principal stress under static conditions, initial static conditions. So before we even look at pore pressures and liquefaction, we can already see in this illustrative case here that we will have, in essence, liquefied almost all of the foundation soil. Another really good way to look at the pore pressure response is to contour the excess pore water pressure. This is pore water pressure that is in excess of the static pore pressures that were there before the earthquake shaking started. And finally, we can see and flag all the elements where indeed the excess pore pressure has reached the minor effective principal stress and as a result we can shade the element a certain color. In this particular case we have shaded it yellow and as I already noted we have almost the entire foundation soil would indicate to be liquefied. I note here that we should attempt to spot check the results with hand calculations. I want to do that uh, for several reasons. I want to demonstrate to you how you can get at some detailed information in the results and just to give you a measure of confidence as to how the cyclic stress ratio is computed. So what we want to do is maybe do a spot check on the cyclic stress ratio. So if we go back to GeoStudio and uh, let's turn off the contours, turn on the mesh, turn off the material colors, and let us zoom into an area here. And uh, what we will do is we will look at the results at uh, a node that is uh, uh, two elements below the desiccated crust. So we'll look at the results at that particular node. So what we can do is say view results information. Before we do that, let us go to the final saved result, the 10 second result. And if we say view result information, and we look at this node at this location immediately below the upstream toe, we get all of this information here. We can break this information down into various categories. In this case, I will look at the liquefaction category, and it says that Quake W can have computed here a cyclic stress ratio of 0.55. looking at all of the information and going near the bottom of the line, of the list rather, we see here that the peak dynamic deviatoric stress is 60.38. So we have 60.38 is the peak deviatoric stress and to now hand calculate the cyclic stress ratio 
we need to go to our initial stresses at time zero and again we say view result information and looking at the same node we notice that the vertical effective stress at that point is 35.97. Recall that the cyclic stress ratio is computed as the peak deviatoric stress dynamic divided by 2 divided by the sigma vertical effective stress under the static conditions. So in our particular case here, the cyclic stress ratio should then be equal to, uh, we said 60.38 divided by 2 divided by the vertical effective overburden stress under static conditions 35.97 and if you recall the formula converting the irregular motion to uniform we multiply this times 0 0.65 so inputting this in our calculator here we have uh, 60 point three eight divided by two divided by thirty five point nine seven times point six five gives us a result very very close to zero point five five so the cyclic stress ratio cyclic stress ratio at this point here then with hand calculations is 0 0.55 the same as was listed in the output results for the quake analysis. The purpose here is to demonstrate that there is an awful lot of detailed information that is available at the node level and the element level which you can use to cross-check the data if that is of interest to you or you have a specific reason to do that. Returning then to our overall results, it's important to note that at, at this stage no correction has been made for initial static overburden stresses and initial static shear stresses. And so because we have not corrected for the initial overburden stress and the initial shear stresses, the results at this stage are somewhat meaningless and unrealistic. However, I wanted to do this just to illustrate what happens when we do not make a proper correction for these factors. So the next topic is to move on to how we correct for the overburden stress and how do we correct for the initial shear stresses in the ground when we look at the pore water pressure response and the potential liquefaction.